Um, man, we are in week two of our Vision Sunday. And week one was all about um, the, the, what you might call the biblical framework for our vision, for, for what's kind of happening here over the next two years, for what we're believing God for. And this week, we're going to be talking about how does that actually happen? If you weren't here on week one, and I, I highly suggest that you uh, spend some time this week and, and watch it, not because it's going to be the greatest sermon you've ever heard, but because if you're here, it's going to be really important for you to have that information uh, that we set out in week one. I'll give you a brief sort of recap of it, and then we're going to launch into what we're talking about today, which is all about the culture that's going to support that vision. Because I'm, I, I am actually convinced, as the saying goes, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Now, I googled that to see who said it because I know I've been to enough like leadership conferences and things like that to know that, that that's kind of a common thing. And it's one of those axioms that it's attributed to more than one person. Like this guy says this said it and, then, and then they said this, this person said it. And so I don't know who said it. I just know it's true. Culture eats strategy for breakfast. I mean, you can have the best laid plans, the most strategic, on point, um, sort of like activities lined up for you to meet your vision. But if it's not your culture, it's not going to happen. And we're going to talk a little bit today about what is culture. What is culture? I have an example to kind of kick us off. I remember, now these details are going to be super fuzzy, and it's, and, and it's going to, you know, I'm, I'm stepping on a little bit of thin ice because the people who are involved in this story are actually here. So I'm going to go back about, uh, so I'm 44. I'm going to go back to when I was about eight or nine, okay? And I was, it, we were having a Cleveland family meeting, okay? So my, my parents actually are at this church. So it's an awesome blessing when your parents go to the church that you pastor, but then it's all, they, they can also fact check you, which is, I don't know, like not awesome all the time. I'd be like, boy, that's not how it happened. So anyways, if you see them doing that to me after the service, I, I missed some of the facts, but I remember sitting on our fireplace. Yes, we have a fireplace in Florida. I'm not sure why, but, but we, we had a fireplace, and we were having this discussion about getting a dog. We wanted to get a dog, and, and I can't remember if we already had a dog or we wanted to get like a bulldog. Was, that was being kind of thrown around in that per particular discussion, and so like the vision was we're going to get a dog, and the strategy was that we need to eat out less. That was the strategy that I can remember my dad saying, and I thought that was so incredibly lame. Like, like pick another thing. You know, don't take my, like, Mickey D's away because we were a really active family, right? And so we went from event to event to event, and we didn't necessarily know that, you know, you, you like, grow a third eye and, and like, a, a fourth hand when you eat at Mickey D's. We didn't know the information that you might know right now, okay? So it was kind of like smoking, you know, back in the day. Like, you didn't know, so it was like, oh, kind of a cultural thing. And then now you know, you're like, wow, that's, that's really harmful. So let me just preface my, my family by saying, we didn't have all the facts on, like, the nuggets we were slamming. But it was, a, it was like a, a normal thing for our family. We had practice and this and that. And we were just going all sorts of different places. And, um, and so eating out was almost like, an, I mean, you could say it wasn't a necessity, but it was kind of seemed like a necessity based on the pace of of what we were doing during those years. And so when dad was like, hey, you know, we, if, we, if we quit eating out as much, then we'll be able to have enough money to, to get this dog. So we had the strategy. It's just that we didn't have the culture to back that up. And so we never, um, after that moment, we never really talked about like, oh, how awesome it is that um, we're sacrificing our eating out in order, in order to get a dog. We didn't celebrate moments along the way. We didn't talk about how amazing it, it would be to have the dog of our choice. We didn't talk, we didn't, nobody went out and, and looked up um, how, to, how to like uh, food prep for the week so that your, you know, your food would be prepared, you wouldn't have to eat out. And, and we, it just, it wasn't, it wasn't like part of our culture. We didn't change anything culturally. We just kind of had a vision and a strategy, but our culture was, man, we still were running from event to event to event, and we needed to eat, and, and it was just quick and convenient and stuff like that, and so we, we didn't really execute the strategy. I think we still got the dog. I'm not sure. I can't remember, but, but like it, you see, it was like the culture didn't support us, and so it didn't, it didn't happen because it wasn't really who we were. Conversely, that we had an unspoken rule, not rule, but uh, I guess I would say value um, or even vision in my home that we were going to uh, do family 
and we were gonna develop significant relationships and learn about life through the vehicle of sports. That was just the thing in my family. And it's not like we had a sit down where we, where we actually strategized how we were gonna do it, but it was such a culture in my family that, that that's what we celebrated. That's what we spent money on. That's what we told stories about. That's what we talked about. And so, and, and, and so it became ingrained in us that like sports weren't just sport. You have to understand, like we're not just an athletic family because we, we sort of like competition. We're an athletic family because that's where we learned how to fall in love with each other. That's how we learned that I'm more than just how I perform. That's, that's where we learned that, that um, my identity is not just wrapped up in, in the final score. Like, we learn so much about one another, and we learn so much about life. We learn how to win. We learn how to, on, on a field or, you know, at a baseball diamond or, or in a gymnasium or a tennis court. Like, it was such a part of our culture, so much so that today it affects my family as well. Now, now we have children who, who have our DNA, and, and so, you know, we kind of, we did athletic things, and so there's a good chance that they might be athletic, but we also have children that do not have our DNA. We've adopted two children, and so we don't know if they're going to like sports or not, but because, it, because that culture that my parents transferred to us was such a part of us, there's a pretty good shot that Cade and Cora are going to have some sort of athletic career. Why? Well, because if you saw a little two-year-old Cora yesterday, she had a Butler Bulldog basketball jersey on. She didn't pick it. I was just like, hey, you get to wear this jersey today. Woohoo! lucky you. And w w so if I connect with my son, how do I connect with my son? A couple different ways, but we play catch and we play ball. And he goes to the field and he watches his older brother play. And if you come on to the, if you watch our TV, there's usually an athletic competition on or we're talking about an athletic competition or we know it's playoff football. I don't even really care about much of the teams in it, but I'm going to be watching today. I care about a few of my friends who love the Eagles, and so fly, Eagles, fly. And so, you know, like, we're, it's just part of our culture. So there's a good chance that kids who don't actually have any of our DNA are going to grow up, and they're going to be a part of that. You see, culture brings things to life way more than, like, any well-spelled-out vision or strategy. Nikki Gumbel from the Alpha Movement talks about culture as being um, things that happen um, spontaneously and repeatedly. Like, they don't always need to be planned out. They're just happening all the time. It's just kind of part of who you are. It happens spontaneously without, like, a lot of planning, and it happens repeatedly. So if you've been around any of my teaching for a while, you'll know that I, I oftentimes talk about two examples, my children and athletics. Why? Well, it, it's just kind of part of my culture, and it's so spontaneous and repeated. You, if you're around this church, you'll know that we tell the truth a lot about ourselves. How you doing? Not well. I'm exhausted. I, I, I'm, I'm feeling prone to wander. I, I, I want to go pick up. I want, um, you know, I'm, I'm not loving my wife like I need to. I've, I've had a week full of gossip. That happens spontaneously and repeatedly. Why? It's part of our culture. We're just, we're, we're we've, believe the gospel enough where we can actually be vulnerable and we can share weaknesses because it makes a big deal out of Jesus. Spontane spontaneity and repetitiveness are things that identify culture. So I looked up the word, right? And so culture is defined as uh, behaviors and attitudes. Be dominant behaviors, so things that you do and attitudes, the way you feel about certain things. Jesus had a culture that he set and that I believe he means for us to lean into with all that we are. If you have your Bibles, we're going to be in John. Um, uh, the same passage that we were in last week, John 14, uh, 12. And we're going to be w walking our way through, but from a different angle uh, today. Last week, we talked a lot about um, some of the things that Jesus did and, and the idea of, of greater works. Guys, this is all under what we're exploring here, not just for these two weeks, but what we're going to be endeavoring to do over the next two years called Vision 2020. We're calling it Vision 2020, Expect Greater Things. Vision 2020, Expect Greater Things. And we're getting this from the heart of Jesus, I believe. And we're, and we're looking in his word, and, and, it's, and it's, it's there. This is, this is like the, um, the heart of the Father, as it was my prayer today, that, that you guys would be caught up in the heart of the Father. Uh, because we believe that this is the culture 
that he wants to set here. And, and I think he wants to do some really um, significant things. We talked last week uh, about how awesome 2018 was and a ton of new things came to life whether it was a youth group or baptizing 37 uh, individuals or whatever the case may be, like life was like just happening because God loves to bring new things to life. And then we transitioned to say, well, what, what, is he, what is he gonna keep doing? Well, he's gonna keep doing that. But I believe, uh, and, and this is just kind of under sort of the Blackaby statement where he says, just figure out what God's doing and join him. I believe what God's doing is he's, he's gonna do a, uh, a radical evangelical work in our area. We're a part of Church United, which is churches coming together for for mission and evangelical fruit. And um, they have a 2023 vision where they'd they'd love to see, and they're believing for the the 3% of the population that's now identified believers to double within those five years. I, I know God is in this movement. I know Jesus prayed for it in John 17, so it's not like a real stretch. I don't have to be a theological genius to get that, that Jesus loves the church united move so that there would be a great advancement of his gospel. So we, we're just going to do our job, man. We're going to do our job in that vision. And so we've, we've broken it down to Vision 2020. We're in a two-year chunk. And, and we're believing that, you know, we're going to see a historic level of evangelical fruit over the next two years. We're believing for and working towards and, and, and praying towards 200 baptisms over the next two, two years. Now, that doesn't happen from my preaching or from any kind of like amazing initiatives or anything like that. It happens from the priesthood of spirit-filled believers going out and expecting greater things than you ever have before. That's how it happens. When the Spirit comes upon you in Acts, it was talking about why did we get the Holy Spirit? We got the Holy Spirit so that we might have power to demonstrate and declare the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Man, we're just believing into that like crazy over the next two years. And we're, we're getting ready to see what God wants to do with that. And so that's kind of the essence of Vision 2020. But it's going to fall flat on its face if there's not the culture of attitudes and behavior that support that. It'll fall flat. And so um, we look at this, this passage again, and we're going to look at it from a cultural standpoint. And not simply just a, um, this is, this is a, the, the basic meaning of it. And so... Um, If you have your Bibles, it'll be, yeah, here it is right here. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me, this is Jesus speaking to his disciples. They were kind of spooked because he's getting close to the end and he's starting to talk about his death and his resurrection and they don't fully understand. And so he's comforting them with this, but he's also encouraging them. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do and greater works than these will he do because I am going to the Father. All right, so um, again, this, is, this would sort of represent our, our brief review, but so last week we talked about what did Jesus do? Well, he, had, he basically had a threefold ministry of preaching, teaching, and healing. So, so we're believing that um, Jesus is saying that his followers, both in that generation and in our generation, we're going to repeat those works. I mean, let's, he, he just says it, right? Like, I'm, I'm not making this up. Uh, whoever believes in me, so that, that's... That's Crystal, it's Joe, it's Mark, it's Catherine, it's Dwayne. Whoever believes in me um, will also do the works that I do. So you have to ask, what did Jesus do? Well, he had that threefold ministry. And so we believe that those things are still happening today. But we believe that all, all three aspects of that, of that ministry, the healing ministry, the teaching ministry, and the preaching ministry, it all pointed to the greater good of seeing people get saved of seeing people come to faith in Jesus as Redeemer, be forgiven of their sins, and be ushered in to an eternal relationship with God both now and forever. That, that's what all those were. You know, when Jesus raises Lazarus, or, or he feeds 4,000 or 5,000, or walks on water, if you're doing the reading plan with us over this last week, you saw Jesus do some, like, whacked out stuff. Why? He wasn't a circus show, man. He didn't need your vote for popularity. I mean, he did, he, he was, it wasn't about gaining attention so that he could just garner a larger crowd. It was him saying, I am the way. And I love you enough not only to die so that you can be forgiven of your sin and given eternal life. I love you enough to live this kind of life where I demonstrate that you don't just have to have blind faith that I am the way. I'm going to walk on water. I'm going to raise the dead. I'm going to heal the deaf. All of these demonstrate something greater than just now this person can hear. It demonstrates the validity of my claims that if you come to me, I will give you joy. I will give you life. 
I will give you things that you could never imagine. That's the work that Jesus, he's, he's doing some really cool things here, but it's all sort of under the context of, of this idea that the, that the Son of Man came to seek and save the law. So we ask ourselves the question, what is Jesus doing like in the greater context? Uh, we, we see, um, I think I have two verses there. We could go to that next one under the works I do. Um, the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Jesus is pretty clear. This is what I'm doing. Don't get sidetracked on some of the really awesome stuff. Understand that it's pointing to this. And, and I think I have a second one there as well. Yeah, uh, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. That's what Jesus is doing. I think John O'Brien even has the tattoo. Is that true, John? Is this one? That, no, he doesn't. Okay. You have an awesome tattoo, right? He has a great tattoo story. If you ever ask him about his tattoo story where he thought it was one verse, and then he changed it, and it's awesome. I was thinking about getting this tattoo, but I just don't have enough flesh on me. <laughs> the, like, the artist would be like, those who are, okay, we're out. <laughs> we went across your whole body. Yeah. Um, so that's what he's doing. So Jesus is like, we're going to do this. We're gonna, this is what we're going to be about. And then he says even greater things that you're going to do. Um, so it's translated greater works, but as I was doing some study on it, they said uh, an even better translation than greater works you're going to do is greater things. And so what that means is like not that you're going to, um, you know, uh, that you're going to one-up Jesus on his raising of the dead or, or you know, feeding the four or 5,000. What it means is the, great, the greater works is the work of spirit-filled believers going out on mission, loving people where they are, pointing them to Jesus, and seeing the spiritually dead come to life. That's the greater work of the body of God. That's what he left us to do. That's the greater work that we have the spirit for. That's why God gave, he said, Jesus is like, I got to go to the Father, and it's going to be better because I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. Not just for your own personal enjoyment, but so that you can be on mission with me doing these, this greater work. We talked last week about how in Acts 2, there are, um, there's a greater number of conversions recorded in Acts 2 than in all of Jesus' earthly ministry. Pointing to the fact that Jesus had now set in motion this revolution where the world was going to get turned upside down by people who understood their brokenness and came to Jesus for his righteousness. He was going to, that's the revolution that's begun. And the world has been changed by people who learn how to rest and then go give themselves fully to the work and person of Jesus. It's been turned upside down. Hospitals, orphanages, the, the, just the, the, we could go on, we could preach a whole message about how the kingdom has, has already impacted and come to, to the, the world we live in and, and how it all points back to how, how Jesus set this greater works in motion. And so it makes perfect sense when Church United and the Avenue Church are like, man, we just, we want to be a part of what God's doing. We want to be a part of the greater works. We want to be a part of historic evangelism in our time. And so that's what we're going to give ourselves to. But we can't do that unless we actually have a culture that matches it. And so as we look today and turn the page into a week two of our um, Vision Sundays, we're, we're going to be camping out on this idea of uh, an expect a greater things culture. Right? So like if it all comes down to, if it all comes down to culture, right? And, and now listen, I'm not saying that outside of the Holy Spirit. I'm saying dependent upon the person and work of the Holy Spirit. That's, that's the given here. But, but if, if, if we have this Holy Spirit, but, but we're not living a Holy Spirit culture, it's not going to really work out. It's going to be kind of like having a good plan, but not rearranging your life to see it come to fruition. And so what we're going to be exploring is like, okay, culture eats strategy for breakfast. All right, I, I got it. It's like, it's, culture is what's going to bring it to life. What is an expect greater things culture? Well, it seems only like biblical and, and really wise for us to look at the person of Jesus, the culture he set, and then look at the spirit he sent and see how those two things actually create that culture. So we're going to look at the culture that Jesus set 
with his 12 and during his earthly time. And then we're going to combine that with the spirit that Jesus sent. And, and we're going to hopefully come to this place where God captures your heart and he captures my heart. And we, we see this greater things culture come to life. So I think there's some shifts um, that need to be made. And let me just, again, before I kind of launch, launch into the shifts, um, we, when you saw our, our John 14 uh, 12 verse, there were two words underlined, believe and because. Believe and because. So those of you who believe in me, so we talked last week what it means to believe in a person. It's not just simply to give mental assent to what they said they've done. It's also to then start to shift your ways to follow them. So Jesus is like, if you, if you believe in me, so that's why we can look to the culture that Jesus set as our culture. So if you believe in me, so like basically the invitation for us is um, if we're followers of Jesus and we're willing to, to set the same culture that he set, the second word is because. Because I'm going to the Father. So if we're willing to set the same culture that Jesus set and we're willing to do it with the power of the Holy Spirit that Jesus promises to send because he's going to the Father and now that's what he's going to give us and he says it's even better that he does that than, than sticks around, well, then, then I think we really can, can wrap our minds around what does that mean practically for us at the AC? And I think there's some shifts um, that need to happen for us, and, and we're just going to work through four of them. And this is actually, um, these, these cultural shifts, uh, and you, you'll see this sort of at the end. I'll just kind of like put them all together. But this is, this is what's going to help guide our preaching year this year. So if you want to know what we're preaching, we're going to be preaching into these four themes. Um, and so the first shift that I think is... Uh, specific to the Avenue Church is, is moving from a culture of attendance to expectation. You have all this on your outline, and so, you know, hopefully take a couple notes and, and look through it, but uh, a culture of attendance, we need to shift from that uh, into a culture of expectation. Remember, this is the culture that Jesus set and that he sent his spirit to empower. Jesus never expected his disciples to just show up. You know, I think that, um, I think that we miss it sometimes when we think, man, we just got to show up. We just got to show up. I think that underplays what God wants to do. You got to show up and expect God to do something. We have to move from a culture that attends events, Bible studies, prayer night, Women's gatherings, men's things, youth retreats, we're pretty good at attending, especially our core, man. Like, we, we go to stuff. You need to hear, I think, from the heart of the Father that, that we need to shift away from that, from just thinking that my attendance at an event is what God wanted, and we need to move into a culture of expecting God's presence to move at that event. You need to come eager when you come into this gathering. No more can you come in and just be like, wow, I wonder what we're going to sing. Like that one, didn't like that one. I wonder if he's going to tell a story that engages me. Went too long. But I'll go get my kids and where we're going to eat. Oh, that was cool. Like, I got a nugget. Put that nugget in my pocket and maybe pull it out Tuesday. Look, man, I already, I already like demean nuggets, right? In the whole McDonald's. This isn't about you getting a nugget. This is about when God, listen, man. <sighs> I just want to be in, like, with you guys right now. This is about when God's people gather. <laughs> this is so awesome. When God's people gather, he says that his presence is there in a more, like, special and specific way than when I'm just, like, walking around Delray like I do sometimes in a prayer walk. Now, that's cool. That's about my relationship with Jesus and my intimacy. This is about his presence. Like the, I'm going to, so some of my Pentecostal friends are going to like this. It's like the Shekinah glory presence of God. Like, like the, the, the fact that God dwells with his people and the whole narrative of the scripture highlights God's dwelling. Does it not? God dwelled with the people in Eden. And then he dwelled with the people in the tabernacle, which pointed to the temple. And now God dwells with his people by the filling of the Holy Spirit. And when two or three are gathered and in one day, we will dwell face to face with God and feast and be in the new world. So when you come here or you go to Wednesday night James study or you go to the Bible study that Steve Pekosha just led, you can know you're not allowed to just show up. 
You've got to come expecting that the presence of God is going to bring healing. It's going to bring power. It's going to bring people to life. It's going to bring encouragement that you're going to need throughout the week that you can share. Like God's going to speak a specific word to your heart. Like God, the comforter and the healer and the father that loves the brokenhearted is going to be there. He wants to meet with you, wants to give you power, wants to convict you, wants to bring new things to life in you, wants to bring people to life. Please don't just come anymore. Now, if you're new here, you're like, what did I just come to? (laughs) You can just come. Next week, I'm going to give you one grace week. And then you got to start expecting. I was reading somewhere, I don't have the author, but he was talking about how some of the reason like, we don't see God work in our life is we actually don't expect him to. So, so we spend so much time not being sure that God's going to work in our life, whether it's personally or with a uh, relationship or in our job or whatever, that, that we like, miss the window of being ready filled with eager expectation in the Holy Spirit for God to do something. And like he was saying almost like half the battle is expecting that, that God's going to do something beautiful and glorious. Now, I don't, this is not a name it and claim it like prosperity gospel where we're like, all right, we're expecting like tons of cash, Lord, next week. Our pockets are open. Here we go. And we want life to be awesome and we don't want any more pain. Listen, remember the person who set this culture went to a cross. So you can expect persecution, pain, and suffering. You can just expect the joy and the contagious life that goes with it. So, okay, all right. I, I know I got four of these, right? And so we got to go. But, um, oh, so <laughs> this is awesome. John 15, 7 says this. If you abide in me, it's in your outline. If you abide in me, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. So, you know, like, um, here's what Jesus is saying. If you you walk with me, if my words walk within you, if my spirit fills you, the expectation is that you would bear much fruit, that you could actually approach the Father and not ask anything in... uh, according to your own agenda, but according to the agenda of the kingdom, and it will be given to you. So Jesus is actually expecting you to bear much fruit. You too should expect upon yourselves in this church, in your moment, your dash. Mine started in 1974. I don't know when it's going to be over. I was at a funeral yesterday, and I was reminded, as we all are at funerals, like it ends at some point. I'm actually just thinking about that right now. I, I want to expect more of my dash, because Jesus expects me to bear much fruit. What's the greatest fruit I could bear, man? The glory to God in seeing people come to life and know the same Father that I know. Expected great fruit. Let's just start leaning into that and expect God to start using you more than maybe you've ever thought of. It's not about attendance. Um, My sort of example for this is Starbucks. Starbucks. Um... Actually, they're my example for my point two. Is that cool if I just move on to point two now? I just looked at my time, and I got to go, okay? We got to go. So I got to keep moving from, expectant, or from attendance to expectation. Hospita- or, look at me. I'm all, I'm all messed up. Give me a second to reorient. All right, I'm back. Here we go. I got lost in that, like, first point. Maybe that's the only point I should preach. Shift number two is a shift from um, the normality to hospitality, from, from normality to hospitality. And here's where Starbucks is the, is the illustration. Um, so Starbucks is way more hospitable than the church at times. Let's just, let's just review our, our, um, our experience with Starbucks. So you walk into Starbucks and you get an immediate greeting. Now that's, that, that's on point now. Thanks to, thanks to Brady, Lauren, the t- hospitality team, we got that on point. But when you go to Starbucks, within, two, within, you get, within the time that you make your order, they know your name. And then your name is pronounced, like you belong there. So they don't just want your order. They're not just going to call out like, you know, uh, caramel frappuccino. They're going to be like, Casey. That's not my order, by the way, so don't judge me. But they're going to be like, straight up black. 
dark roast most of the time. Casey. So now they know me because you know me at a different level if you know my name. People who know my name, if I remember your name, you, you immediately feel, because I'm meeting a lot of people that I care about you, that I love you, that I tried. Even if I get your name wrong, I hope you, you know that I love you and I'm trying. They know my name. I've, I've been greeted well. Then they give me something I want. They, they, they give me something that will actually better my life. Now we could make an argument. Okay, so like, just, I don't, settle down. You don't need to tell me like how, how it's not great. But they, but they give me something that actually allows for my fur, further flourishing. They, they, they're not just necessarily like meeting a need, but like they've, they've thought about me. I mean, the essence of hospitality is thinking about the other. It's like preparing for the other. They've created a menu that's actually based on what customers want. And then they have the special menu, right? So they're willing to go above and beyond. Then they've made this space that's for the most part clean and welcoming where you can go there and you can spend three to four hours on a $2.78 cup of coffee and not feel like you ever have to leave. Chill. Come on, this is like your third place, man. Oh, you want to do business? You need to do family? Somebody's going to cry in a counseling session? You're going to cast vision? Uh, you just want to read your Bible? It's cool. We just, we just want you to feel like you can, you can stay here. The essence of hospitality is having forethought of another person. So you can actually be hospitable through a text, through a word of encouragement. You can be hospitable in a, in a ton of different ways. But what I think we need to do is grow as a church from the normal expectation of hospitality to Jesus' culture of hospitality. Now watch this. Here, here's his culture. You ready? Um, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belong to their sect complained to his disciples, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus was willing to break the norm so that he could usher in the hospitable heart of his father. I mean, we as a church need to be willing to break the norm, whatever that is for you personally and whatever that's been for us over the last eight years, in order that we might have hands and homes that usher people into the heart of our hospitable God. A third shift that we need to make is this idea of empowerment. And I, and I called it a shift from ownership to empowerment. From ownership um, to empowerment. Jesus not only loved the wrong guys and girls, and we famous for that, but he also empowered the wrong people. He seemed to give authority and power to, like, to like the wrong people, and even maybe at the wrong time in their life. Look at Mark 6, 7 with me. It's in, it's in your ally. And he called the 12 and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over unclean spirits. Now, I just heard about these 12 from Steve Bakosha in our Bible study. It's 850 to 950. It like tripled from Bible study number one. Why? Because you, you hunger for the word. You love the word. And it was awesome. Thank you, Steve. And, and one of the things that he was m making mention of is during the last um, five chapters of Mark, it seemed like the disciples, they didn't get it, at least fully. Like, it wasn't, like, fully ingrained in them. It's like, I, I don't fully understand what's happening here. And yet, Jesus was like, here, I'm going to give you my authority, which is divine authority. You're going to get to go cast out demons, and you're going to be my representatives. They hadn't finished a class. They were in the middle of their tutoring. They were in the, 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 the three years wasn't up. They hadn't completed a course. They were in, they were in process. And Jesus is like, I'm going to give you my authority. Now go, Peter and John and James and the rest of you men who don't fully understand. You are going to get empowered early to go be kingdom ambassadors for me. I'm not, I'm, not gonna, I'm, not, I'm not bouncing from the scene. I'm going to be here. When you come back, we're going to review. I'm, we're gonna, you're going to get better. You're going to get better. You're going to get better. But, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to empower. I'm not going to own this thing on my own. I'm going to empower you so much so that I'm going to be able to say it's going to be better when I leave. We want a church that's better when you're gone. Or we probably haven't done our job. You, like if this church doesn't 
do something, greater works. By the time this generation, myself included, is gone, we've missed it. We owned stuff too much instead of empowered. You know, there's a great culture that not only Jesus set, but that works over and over and over again, and it's the culture of AA. If you look at when you can actually sponsor someone else and walk someone else through the steps, it's way earlier than probably the church would be comfortable giving that type of authority and, and, and empowerment to. But it works because, man, when you're fresh and, and you, you're excited and you're filled with the spirit of sobriety, man, you, you want to give that away. You have a passion to give that away, and it's very close and near and dear to your heart. And then that culture becomes a culture of giving away rather than ownership. Now, is there a difference between empowerment and then balancing that with what the scripture says about don't be too quick to lay hands on somebody? Of course. Empowering somebody for a particular task is different than calling them an elder in your church. Two different things. We need to see a shift here at the Avenue Church from, from a few of us who own a lot to a culture of empowering others under the Spirit of God. And then finally, there's a, our final culture here is a culture of invitation. We need to move from, invitation, or from information to invitation. I'm going to ask our elders to come up and we're going to get ready to serve communion. Um, this culture of information is, is one that's prevalent here in our society. We love information. And there'll be times when I can preach a whole message and maybe even unfortunately live a whole life and give out a lot of information about Jesus, but never actually invite people to the person of Jesus. Are, can you nod your head if you understand that? If you, are you with me? Like, like we, we can be really good at informing people. And people love information, and they can even like grasp like, oh, wow, that's good, that's good, that's good. I could preach a whole message informing you about the person of Jesus Christ without ever actually inviting you to him. We have a ton of information at the AC. We're a small little church, but you come around here, we are saturated with good information. What we need to see a shift in is not that we lose that information, but that we grow more in our ability to invite people to the person of Jesus and not just inform people about him. I spent a long time, well, it wasn't a long time, depends on who you ask, but my wife and I had this pretty quick, it seemed like forever courtship, six months, all right? Don't recommend it to my daughter if she's here right now. But after six months, I just, I just knew like, that's, that, was God's, that was God's best to me. Like, I, I, I want that. And so I spent six months informing her of my love for her. I mean, not on day one, right? But like probably week two, whatever. <laughs> Details are fuzzy. But I informed her. But then there was a day on Worth Avenue, which is where we had our first date, where I was in a hallway, an in covered stairwell with a muriel of Henry Flagler that... I don't know why I remember it, just because it was a big moment in my life where she was at the top of the stairs wondering, what are we doing here? And I was like, oh man, this is it. This is where it's going to happen. This is, all right, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. And then I got down on the knee and I was like, all right, basically I'm done informing you and I probably informed her of a little bit, but I want to invite you to spend the rest of your life with me. I want to invite you to me. I'm done informing you about this. I want to invite you into this. I mean, we just need to get better at it as a church, as in, to, inviting people to the person of Jesus and letting him do that healing and transformative work rather than thinking all of our information is going to do that. And so that's what this moment's about, is, is an invitation to communion. Um, as we make it about Jesus over and over and over again, the communion table is for those who have made their life about Jesus, for those who follow Jesus, who know him, believe in him, have made their ways about him. The communion table is for those of you who have um, examined your life. You, you've asked the Spirit to continually just reveal sin, and, and you know that when sin is revealed, you work on it, you put, you put it to death, and you move forward. 
The communion table is for those who are failing forward. So if you're not a believer, or if you've come to that spot where you just harden your heart to God, you're like, I'm not doing that. I, it's a good time to just think through it and let the Spirit meet you where you are and change your heart and, and not come. But for those of us who are just kind of like me, like super, super needy, but hopeful at the same time, all of Jesus, and the communion table's for you. And before we open it up, I want to make sure that I specifically invite you, not just to the table, but to the person of Jesus. So if you've never understood yourself to be a sinner, a hell-deserving sinner, a sinner that like comes up against a holy and righteous God and fails not only because of what you do, but because of why you do it, because of what you left undone, like because, because our heart runs contrary to a, a holy and righteous God. If you've never understood yourself like that, let me invite you to understand like that's your reality. That's my reality every day. And I can't work my way out of it. I can't serve my way out of it. And I certainly can't preach my way out of it. But I can come to a person who loves and is famous for taking people like me out of it. And that's what faith and repentance is all about. So I invite you to believe that about yourself and to believe that Jesus knows that and desires you deeply. That he went to a cross and he was crushed for your sin. He paid the price that you could never pay and on the third day was brought back from the dead. And that demonstrates the love, the love, the love of the Father that is behind this whole culture. We receive that simply by turning from ourself, saying, Jesus, you are enough. Those of you who come to him by faith, by a change of mind and a change of heart, a change of basically saying, no longer my way, your way. We're not only forgiven, but we're invited to continually partake in this moment that nourishes us spiritually by the presence of the Spirit. So I'm gonna ask, uh, when you're ready, we have uh, two guys here and a couple, couple on the surrounding edges, I think. We're gonna have a song going. Just come and, and take part of the juice and, and part of the cracker. Bring it back to your seat and we'll, we'll all take, we'll all take together. You're welcome to do that when you're ready. Let me be real clear. Before we take, let's be even more specific on the invitation because I may have just done it. I may have just informed you about Jesus without actually inviting you to the person. So we're gonna have a moment of invitation right here. Just where you are. If there are those of you who are with us who have never actually come to the, to the resurrected Jesus, you do that through faith and, and repentance. So right now, right, right where you are, this is a moment of invitation. Just pray with me. Say, Jesus, I actually believe that I am broken and that I have no relationship or even, even understanding of this true God without you. And I am coming to you for forgiveness and for life and for meaning because I believe you died on a cross. You overcame my sin and my death. And you're living right now and through your Holy Spirit, you're inviting me to come to you. I can't see you. I can't touch you right now. But I know you're at the right hand of the Father, and I, and I give you my life. I give you my ways. And I pray that you would do these greater things in and through me. I receive your invitation by faith. Jesus, in your name I pray, amen. On that night, he took the bread and he broke it and he gave thanks and said, when you do this, let it, let it be remembered that this is how my body would be broken for you. Take and eat. On the same night, he took the cup and he, and he poured out the wine and he said, let it be remembered that my blood will be poured out so that you don't have to pour yours out, so that you can be forgiven because that's how forgiveness happened. The Old Testament pointed to it and Jesus fulfilled it. Also, Paul tells us that when we eat and drink of the body and blood of Christ, that we actually not only remember, but we look forward to when he's coming again. So, so drink in that nature. Now I'm going to ask you to rise and pronounce a benediction over you. And 
It's going to be a different benediction than you're used to, okay? So are you ready? I'll just give you a warning. Now, if you're comfortable, benedictions are received with your hands like this. And after the benediction, I'm going to get out, and we're going to do one more song in response. But it's 11:16 right now, and so if you've got two parents here, one parent should probably go get kids. But don't leave until you've received the benediction, and then come back with your kid and finish the worship song. Here we go. Benediction is like a promise and a blessing and all that sort of stuff. Now may the God of greater things begin to show up in you more and more so that you never go to work again on a Monday and not expect the gospel to go forward. So that you never go into a Starbucks on a Tuesday and not think that you're going to have the opportunity for a word of encouragement or a smile that points to the resurrected Christ. And may that same God on a Wednesday bless you and keep you so that when you go to your Bible study, you're expecting great gospel encouragement that will be contagious beyond those who are in the room. And on a Thursday, may that same God bless you and fill you so that when you go home, you see that as your primary church and you get to work as a missionary first and foremost there. And on a Friday, when you enjoy the goods of Delray, Boca, or Boynton, that you do it in such a way where you are eager and expecting that God is going to bring someone to your table, to your existence, to your life, waiter, waitress, whatever it might be, that begins a conversation that leads to this hope that you have. And may that same God meet you on Saturday. And you expect that you will start to dream new dreams and see new things. And may he come back here on Sunday. And may he heal you and bless you and keep you and send you out to do the same over and over and over again so that every moment you make it about Jesus. Amen and amen and amen. Love you guys.